Good morning, everyone, and um, welcome to this morning's meeting. Um, I am Councillor Ivan Jewell, the chair of the Corporate Parenting Panel. For those of you that didn't know that already, uh, we welcome you all to our remote Corporate Parenting Panel taking place on the 30th of April 2021. Um, uh, this meeting has been recorded live to the Council website and will be available to be viewed for a minimum of six months. Please be aware that any footage from the meeting can be used in subsequent media broadcasts. <clears throat> I would like to uh, extend a warm welcome to members, officers and any members of the public or media who are watching this live feed of the meeting. Before I commence with the formal business on the agenda, I would like to cover some of the housekeeping issues for us all to follow. Please bear with me on this one. Um, I'm sure that you've heard it so many times before. Could all participants please mute their microphone, blur their background where possible, to speak using the chat function on the right hand side, type RTS, request to speak. Remember that um, in the meeting, it can be seen by all of those uh, present. When invited to speak by myself as chair, remember to unmute your microphone. And if it's the first time you've spoken, if you can introduce yourself, and which division you are, are covering if you are a, a councillor. Once invited to speak, um, as I say, please introduce yourself. If you have any issues with connectivity, try switching off your video and use just the audio function. If connectivity issues continue, you may have to leave the meeting and rejoin to get a better signal. Unfortunately, my um, vice, vice chair is, is unable to attend uh, today, um, so I would normally say that um, Councillor Heather Smith would uh, resume control if I lose connectivity. Um, in, in this year, I haven't lost connectivity once, and so I'm hoping and assuming that that won't happen. Um, if it does, then we will need to handle that in, in, in the best way we can. Uh, so, uh, without further ado, can we move into the formal agenda for this morning's meetings? And so, can I ask for apologies for absence, please? Yes, Chair, we have apologies from Councillors Charlton, Considine, Makepeace, Potts, Scott and Smith, and Wendy Taylor, Martin Stenton and Chris Baines. Thank you very much for that, Ian. Um, are there any substitute members, please? No, Chair, we have no substitute members in attendance this morning. Well, that's quite understandable at this very busy time. OK, can we now go on to the minutes of the previous meeting held on the 26th of February 2021? You've all had copies of the minutes and I assume that you've uh, read through them. So can we just first of all go through those, um, those minutes for accuracy, please? Can we look at page one? Page two? Page three, page four, page five, page six, page seven, and finally page eight. Can I ask, um, uh, do we all, um, do we have any minutes arising? Uh, uh, sorry, matters arising from the minutes? I'll give you a little time if you need to type in the, the box, the RTS. <coughs> it appears that there are no matters arising. Can I therefore ask uh, someone to propose acceptance of the minutes, please? I'd like to uh, um, accept them, Ivan, please. It's Councillor Shirley Quinn from Shildon and Dean Valley. Thanks very much, Councillor Quinn. And do we have a seconder for that, please? Don't all rush at once. Councillor Anne Reid from the Crook Division. I'll second that, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Reid. I was getting a little worried there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so let's go on to the next. Um, do we have any declaration of interest, please? It would appear that there's no declaration of interest. So can we move on to the next uh, item on the agenda, item five? And can we have a number of looked after children's? Uh, we're going to receive a verbal update um, from Helen, I believe. Over to you, Helen. Thank you. Morning, everybody. It's Helen Ferguson, Head of Children's Social Care. 
Um, in relation to the numbers of children in our care um, as of this morning, uh, the number is 937 children. Um, you'll recall that we did have an increase in the numbers of children in our care throughout COVID last year, um, partly as a result of court delays and such like. So the numbers of our children um, peaked in December at 970 children. And the last time we met um, in our meeting, it was 959. So you can see that those numbers are now starting to come back down um, and they're much, they're pretty much back to the same level that they were this time last year, um, which is a really good indication that all of the um, systems and processes around children in the court arena and such like are, are kind of moving back into more normal, um, normal, more normal working patterns. So as of this morning, 937 children in our care. <coughs> Thanks very much for that, uh, Helen. Uh, is there any member have any questions of Helen, please? It looks like you're getting off pretty lightly there, Helen. So thank you very much for that. Um, that was most useful. Thanks a lot. So can we now move on to item six on the agenda, please? And it's invested in children. And I'm going to pass over to Robert Johnson for a report. And I believe he has the, some of the young people here with him, which we always look forward to um, seeing and hearing. Over to you, Robert. Good morning, members. My name is Robert Johnson. I uh, work for Invest in Children and support Durham CIC members to participate in decision making and influence in the work what goes on around the county. I'm just going to hand it over to two young people who are part of Durham CICC um, and they're also like linking in with corporate parent panel to update you regularly um, and that's Mitchell and that's Leslie. So I'll pass it over to Mitchell first. I think it's Leslie first. Okay. <laughs> Leslie, yeah. you're on. Leslie, you're on mute. Leslie. Thanks Hi. So much. <laughs> um, we've got a PowerPoint that we're going to run through on what the CICC have been doing, the Children and Care Council. So firstly, some older um young, like older care leavers have um, started a positive relationship project where we've been able to get some funding, which I think it's £10,000. Um, and the purpose is to have a look at the impact of domestic abuse and other forms of abuse and educating people at an earlier age through peer led awareness workshops um, in schools. Yeah, and then the next bit is children and the Children and Care Council members are going to be working with the virtual head team um, to apply for funding to undertake educational activities um, by the Children and Care Council Working Group, uh, which will oversee the project development. This is an exciting project as it increases the participation of the young people to decide how the pupil premium is spent, um, so the young people will be able to apply for a small grant of that and it can be used, for example, going out with the carers on um, trips and stuff like that and doing activities with them. I'm now going to hand back over to Leslie to go through the next slide. Um, the younger CICC has been able to have a first face to face meeting where I think five young people or eight young people attended and they have been able to develop some artwork for the Full Circle Centre. Um, we have some CICC members have also supported the launch of the Mind of My Own app, which has been very exciting, along with um, un undertaking interviews for new social workers. And um, someone has already mentioned about the podcast that we've been able to um, release. So um, we now have a podcast called We Are No Different. So I'm going to hand over back to Ms. Mitchell. Yeah, um, so the next bit is Children and Care Council members are developing the first ever police training session, which will be facilitated by young people and is being used as a pilot scheme to take place in May. Um, future training plans will be developed after the pilot session has been reviewed and young people, and this is to do with young people going missing and working with the police um, to connect them back. 
And the next bit is peer mentoring training has been offered to some young people in children homes, along with continuous professional development training to staff by investing in children. A further six young people from Children and Care Council have also signed up to become peer mentors for the younger group. And lastly, we just want to share a positive story um, about a young girl who's connected with the Children and Care Council coming from Coxo Children's Home and has been developing information and undertaking the peer mentor programme. She has said every child is different, kind of flower and together make the world a beautiful garden, which is really positive. And it's on the um, PowerPoint as well. Thanks very much, Robert. Do you have anything to say? Just to follow up on the education project, I know some young people have like campaigned to influence the pupil premier. And so we're, we're going to be working with um, a virtual head team with a budget for children and young people to apply to directly. It's in its early days. We are having conversations with the younger group. We met on Wednesday night and they've got some really, really good ideas of how they think that should be done, including what is education. And I think education can be a wide range of things and opportunities. And they'll kind of support that and work with Melanie and a virtual ed team for children and young people to directly apply to. We haven't agreed on a maximum or a minimum, but we're working through that. OK, so does that conclude the presentation, uh, Robert? It does. Thank you, Chair. Right. Well, can I say thank you very much to you? And can I say uh, thank you especially to the young people, to Leslie and to Mitchell? Um, it's always good to see you. And I'm, I'm pleased that you come along and I'm pleased that you're able to participate and give us information from your perspective. I think that that's very important. I hope you feel comfortable in these meetings and you feel equal because you certainly are. And we are we very much appreciate. And as I'm looking at the, the comments down on my right hand side in the chat function, everyone is saying uh, thank you very much. And it's been very nice uh, to, to have your presentation um, and we have enjoyed it very much. Thanks very much. Could I just ask if, if, if there are any any members that want to ask any questions on, on the presentation? No, so you've got out of likely young people there. That's that's great, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so let's move on to the next item on the agenda. And that next item is item seven, and that's adoption coast to coast update. And we're, it's going to be presented by Paula uh, uh, Gibbons. And um, look forward to your presentation, uh, Paula. Thank you, Chair. Morning, everybody. Um, well, obviously, uh, Mitchell and Leslie are a hard act to follow. And uh, you, you may remember from the last time my IT skills could do with a bit of a brush brush up. So I am going to try and uh, share the presentation that and um, the PowerPoint that you've already received, if that's all right. Has everybody got that now? I've got it there. That's fine. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Um, Obviously, I attended Corporate Parent Committee um, a couple of months ago, and I think I mentioned that we were Adopt Coast to Coast was due to launch, and we had our virtual launch on the 1st of April. It wasn't quite what we had hoped for, but obviously with COVID and um, national restrictions, we were limited to that. But it was a very well well attended and well received event, which was lovely to um, to thank really all the staff across the three spokes for all the absolutely hard work to get us to go, to launch. Um, so the three spokes are Cumbria, Durham and Together for Children. And our model of, um, of regionalisation is very different from the other ones uh, nationally, as it's a partnership model. So the services for the adoption teams and services remain in the local authorities. And myself as head of service, I have oversight of the performance and practice to improve outcomes for all of our children and young people across the three local authorities. Um, we're really lucky. We have a, a dedicated communications and marketing officer um, who's come from private industry and um, haley has been really, really front running in terms of developing um, our, um, our website, our Facebook, Instagram. And we were very lucky to secure a first year budget of £40,000 um, to 
to support us in our recruitment of adopters. Um, it's really it's really interesting when you launch a new a new agency like this because part of it is about getting the name known and for people to understand that um, Adopt Coast to Coast builds on the absolute strengths and commitments of three adoption services. So it's really important that that um, that history and that that level of knowledge is understood by people who are starting their journey as, as prospective adopters. Um, we have a new inquiries and outcomes system, which has been supported by um, our IT colleagues, which allows us to um, allows um, prospective adopters to record their interest via the, um, the website, and that then automatically is allocated to the relevant spoke depending on the postcode of the applicant. Um, and we have a telephone number which is hosted by Durham. Um, and so we're getting some really good statistics about people who ring us, you know, what the queries are, all so that we can continue to develop the service as we go forward. I thought it might be helpful just to give a little bit of a performance update um, from the three uh, spokes from for 2021. So across the three local authorities, um, we approved 77 prospective adopters and we've got um, 24 prospective adopters who are in stage one. 23 who 23 who are in stage two and 18 who were approved by the end of March but didn't have a link with a child so that's not it's it's a good start for us we're not starting with zero um, but we do recognize that you know adoption is a challenging world in terms of um, giving people the confidence to come to um, us as a new agency to um, pursue their wish to adopt um, we regularly have um, children who have ADM decisions. So they have plans of adoption, but they haven't been ratified by the court yet. Um, and it's really important for us to keep, to, to look at those children and to be very aware of them. Because one of our, um, one of the ones things we really want to do with this is early linking. So that once children are placed, have a placement order, there's a minimum delay um, in securing um, adoption for them. Um, we work with um, voluntary colleagues and other RAs across the country to secure uh, families for our children. But of course, as you would, you know, you would want, we really do want to keep them, our children in the northeast because that's where the services are, that's their cultural heritage, um, and so that makes life much easier for them going forward. And also relationships with brothers and sisters. If they're not placed together, then obviously if they're in the same locality, that's much better for them. Um, I've just on that slide, you know, we've got, we have, we matched 130 children across the region. Um, and I know our chair is a member of the adoption panel. So he'll, he'll know the number that have come through um, Durham's adoption panel. It's been phenomenal. Um, and all three agencies have continued to work incredibly hard during what has been an incredibly difficult time for everybody. Um, and just to say, obviously, I just mentioned that we do place children um, via interagency. Um, and so across the, um, the three authorities, we placed 60 children in that last year's period. I just wanted to finish really with the key priorities for Adopt Coast to Coast for the first year. It's really exciting. We've, we've, we've launched, which in itself was a bit of a challenge. You're, you're not sure how these things are going to go. Um, but it's really what we really need to do, as I've already said, is establish Adopt Coast to Coast as, as, an, as the go to agency for those who are interested in adoption. Um, we want to develop our branding um, alongside the, the, the known branding in the, um, of the local authority partners. We are going to continually review our marketing activity to ensure its best value and best return on investment. And as I say, having, having had a dedicated post um, in Haley, it's just going to, that's just going to be so much easier for us to achieve. Um, we want to support the adopters' journey and make sure that it's as streamlined as possible um, and consistent across the three. Prospective adopters need to know that if they start their journey with Durham, it would be the same as if they'd started their, their journey with the other two spokes. Um, as I said, we want to really establish early linking and matching. We want to be having our children uh, linked to adoptive families before the placement order is granted. Particularly for Durham as well, we really need to embed our early permanence practice so that's fostering for adoption in Durham. Um, so that's a piece of work I'm going to be doing um, as part of my head of service role. And um, we really, we really recognise that you know the needs of adoptive families 
post the adoption order are critical for children's ongoing success and best outcomes throughout their lives. So it's really important for us to work together to develop them. And, you know, each of the agencies brings strong services, but as you know, anything in local authority, there's always room for improvement. So thank you. I don't know if there's any questions. Thank you very much for that, Paula. Um, I um, I think I have some, but I'll, I'll leave them up and then I'll invite uh, Councillor Bainbridge first. Hi, Paula. That, that was really great. Uh, I really enjoyed listening to it and it sounds positive for the children who are in our care for adoption. And it seems as though we're moving forward really well now. And I'll, I, I always thought when you fostered, you were already in line to be asked to be adopted where you said you've got this new fostering for adoption. So I, I think that sounds good as well. So people do know when they're fostering, they're there to adopt, and then you'll get the lead of the people who want to adopt, but try fostering first. I think that's really positive. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bainbridge. Thanks very much. And uh, Councillor Reid? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you, Paula. Um, I'm just I just want to say uh, well done. Um, I think adopt is um, a, attracting quite an awful lot of um, adopters. Uh, there's a good cohort of uh, people uh, in there that you've said. Um, I was just wondering, Paula, whether um, you know when you when people have when foster carers have the children, would you um, would there be an option to look at the families around that child who who could adopt that? Um, child as well. Rather, I mean, I know that there is options there for them to foster, but would you look at them as being a, adopters? Yeah. If thank you. Get what I mean. Sorry. No, I do. Thank you, Councillor Reid. Absolutely, we do. It's about considering what's in the child's best interests, and we do often have um, foster carers who choose to adopt, and also their extended families who may express an interest. And we work very closely with the fostering service, if that's the case, to um, assess those families as, adopt as adopters. Um, so absolutely no option is off the table for our children. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Councillor Reid, and thank you for, for your response, Paula. Uh, so it uh, looks like it's my turn now, Paula. Um, no need to worry. Um, <laughs> I, I just feel it's important to challenge um, officers on certain aspects. <laughs> um, can I say congratulations on being appointed to the position? It's a, a very challenging position, uh, but I'm sure that you are up for it and uh, that, that um, you will rise to the challenge. And I look forward to seeing uh, adoption um, develop, uh, adopt, develop. Um, as you know, I, I, um, adoption is very close to my heart and um, I think it's a very, very important aspect. Uh, but from my experience, I, I look at three aspects of the ad adoption process. And the, the first for me and the most important is the, the children and young people, um, hopefully children, um, but sometimes young people, um, the um, adopters and also staff. And I think that when we're looking at development, we quite often look for development in terms of efficiencies. Uh, and I think what we have to do is think about the knock on effect of efficiencies. I know in this modern age, efficiencies are all important, but I think that if it has a, 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 a negative knock on effect to the other two aspects, to the children uh, experience and, and to the adopters uh, experience, um, you know, that, that, that could prove sort of a difficult situation. So all I'll say is just keep an eye on those two aspects as well, uh, Paula. Uh, best of luck in the future. Um, I'll probably bump into you sometime, even though um, I, I won't be uh, part of the corporate parenting plan anymore. So thanks for your presentation. Oh, thank you, Councillor Jewel. It's been a pleasure working with you. You know that. I, I won't comment on that. <laughs> OK, OK, we'll move on to the next um, uh, item on the agenda, which is item seven, and it's a missing from home update. And I believe that Lisa Wood is going to give us this report. Uh, over to you, Lisa. Sorry, I'm on mute. Morning, everyone. Um, bear with us while I try and share my screen. Not the best at it.
Has that worked? Yes, I can see it, or almost. That's great. OK, so I'm Lisa Wood. Um, I'm one of the strategic managers in Durham's Children's Social Care, and I've got responsibility for child exploitation and children who go missing. Um, so I'm going to update you since the last time I updated the panel, which was, I think, in 2019. So we've made some massive um, changes since 2019. The first um, one is a partnership partnership definition and criteria of when a child goes um, missing from home and care. So we worked with our police colleagues to um, combine the definition so that all of our data and performance matches, um, but also that allows us to have a joint understanding of the, the picture in Durham, um, and also we can then provide an appropriate response. So to help us with that, we appointed a partnership data analyst um, and Sam Level was um, seconded from um, Durham Constabulary to help us with that. We also recognised that there was a lot of um, professionals um, undertaking return to home um, interviews when a child returns after, after they've gone missing. Um, and the quality and understanding of what's needed for a return to home interview was really varied. So we appointed a local authority missing from home coordinator and that role is to ensure that there's a single point of contact in children's services for children who go missing. To undertake all of the return to home interviews for children who are in our care and that allows us for that, that allows our child to have an independent session with somebody who can talk about what's happened to them while they were missing but also to work very closely with the police mission coordinators. So they meet, they meet every morning for a daily dynamic meeting and they talk about all children who've gone missing in the previous 24 hours, any children that we're, we're concerned about, and again, to share information between um, children's services and police so that we can provide an appropriate response and a timely response. Working very closely with the police allows us to share um, intelligence and risk information that's been gathered in the return to home interviews to really gain an understanding of trends and um, pictures, familiar names. Um, and we can pass that information through to our police arrays analyst in a really timely way. Our DSCP Strategic um, Child Exploitation Group started with a very quite narrow focus of child sexual exploitation. And what we've um, come to recognise over the last couple of years is that exploitation or extrafamilial harm, including children who go missing, can take many forms. So we've expanded um, the remit of, of that group um, and we've also expanded the membership to um, ensure that we include voluntary sector groups um, members of um, services who represent our LGD, LGBTQ community, children who have additional needs and our young people who have offending behaviour to give a really good overall understanding of the picture of exploitation and children who go missing in Durham. As part of that work, we've identified some additional um, subgroups who report into the strategic keg. And part of that is to um, develop some real insight and intelligence, really gather a picture of children who go missing from home and our care in Durham. And the other groups, other subgroup, which has been newly developed, is a contextualised safeguarding group. So looking at how we can provide a partnership response to children where the harm is happening outside of their home, in our communities, in places and spaces in Durham. So from a data perspective, it's worthy of note that there has been an increase in the number of children who have gone missing from home and children in our care 
over the last year. But it comes with a little bit of a warning saying, as I mentioned earlier, we've created a new definition in line with our police colleagues, which may have increased the numbers of reported children who go missing. However, we do think that during the co um, during COVID, we have had more children who have been worried about who we go missing. What's also worthy of note is the numbers of return to home interviews offered and those accepted and those undertaken and shared with our police colleagues. And that's a direct result of having a dedicated post and improving the quality of return to home interviews and talking to children who have gone missing. So how have we responded to children who've gone missing from, from home and care during COVID? Well, we've tried to minimise any disruption in our services. We've continued to see children during COVID, obviously abiding by COVID rules. And um, we've some of the examples of that is walk and talk sessions. So meeting children and young people outside of the family home, going for walks, which has allowed children to be able to tell us what's happened to them while they've been missing. This has really helped to reduce the dropout rates of children who were worried about and con um, helped us to continue to form really positive relationships with those young people. During this time, we've in, um, introduced a weekly dynamic meeting of all, all members of the URAS team. So that's all, all of the police officers and children's services um, interventions workers from the child exploitation and missing team. And that's helped us understand children who were, were worried about on a weekly basis, any children who we haven't had any contact with um, and allowed us to, to provide that dynamic response on a weekly basis. We've been very lucky to um, be given some additional funding to help uh, respond to the increase of children who go missing from home and care um, during COVID. So we've had an additional, um, from this month, we've had an additional um, missing from home coordinator and an additional child exploitation worker join the team. We've had a number of audits and inspections around um, child exploitation and children who go missing, and this, we've learnt lots from that. Um, last year, we had an independent inquiry into child sexual abuse, and one of the categories under that inspection that they looked at was children who go missing from, from home and care. That report hasn't been published yet. That report should be published um, later on this year, but we haven't we haven't just um, we're not waiting for that report. We've taken the learning and used that inspection as almost as a, a self-assessment of where we are now um, and put things in place that we thought needed and approved um, at the time. We've also had a, a, a DSCP, a Durham Children's Safeguard and Partnership multi-agency audit around return home interviews. And as a direct result, that was the reason that we, um, we recruited a, a dedicated person to help us improve the quality of those interviews and to help us understand the harm and the risk that happens to children when they go missing and so that we can respond. One of the things that came out in the inspection was the consistent use of language and how we describe resting vulnerabilities to children who go missing from home or care. And part of that work, children and young people have helped us design a language document, which has been um, cascaded across all professionals who work with young people to help everybody understand the importance of how we write about children and especially those who've gone missing or who've been vulnerable to exploitation. That's the end of my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for that, Lisa. Very comprehensive indeed. Um, I'm not seeing anyone uh, requesting to speak here. Um, sometimes happens when the, the report is so comp comprehensive that it, it doesn't invite questions. Uh, so can I thank you for that uh, most sincerely? Um, very comprehensive and bring us up to date with the situation. Thanks very much, Lisa. Thank you very much. OK, so can we move on? I'm looking at the clock here and we're doing pretty well. This is most unlike me, uh, but we'll move on to item nine of the agenda, and that's the independent visitor service. And I believe that we have um, 
uh, Mark Smith and Mark Den uh, Hollander here, here to, to give us a presentation. I have noticed that, that Mark is here. I'm not sure about, uh, sorry, Mark um, Den Hollander is here, but I haven't noticed Mark Smith. Uh, maybe you can help us on this one, Mark Den Hollander. Thanks Hi. very much, over to you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Mark Den Hollander. I'm the Independent Visitor Coordinator um, based with the Youth Justice Team. I don't think Mark Smith's coming this morning. I think he's probably sent apologies. Um, this uh, report was triggered um, by, by a request for information by the National uh, Independent Visitors Network for information from the chair of this panel, I think, and from the chairs of committees. But this was a great opportunity to give you an overview of what's happened over the last year um, with the Independent Visitor Service during what was quite a tricky time. Um, I will share a, a general presentation and add a little bit in that the National Independent Visitor Network wanted answered um, with regard to, to their request. So I too will have a go at technology. There we go. Hopefully that's come up. OK, so just to put into context, because a, a lot of people sort of. Um, Excuse me, Mark, can, can I just interrupt that you, you, you've you got it on this uh, small. You haven't got the whole slide there. I wonder if you could click on the top yeah. corner and, and, and so you're putting the whole slide so it's rather larger. That's lovely. Thanks very much. Got it. Lovely. Thanks. Um, yeah, just to put into context what the Independent Visitor Service um, is, um, introduced in the Children's Acts in 1989 and an independent visitor is a statutory responsibility of the local authority to be offered to every looked after child and it is delivered very differently um, on a national level. Just some statistics about um, looked after children nationally there and the reason that I popped that on is because one of the requests from the National Independent Visitor Network was to try and reach 10% of all looked after children within, um, within the local authority area and currently nationally we're working at 3.5%. So for Durham, that would be around 95 young people that we would reach. Um, nationally, again, there's a lot on waiting lists and we are doing our very best here to ensure and have ensured that all those young people that are on waiting lists um, have been uh, cleared away and have been matched with independent visitors. It sits this service with Durham Youth Justice Service um, so that's the team that I work with. Um, it, nationally, it's on a, a very, very different places and it came into existence because of a report back in 2019. So this post started uh, right at the beginning of lockdown, 1st of April 2020, a great time to start a role. And the role of, of an independent visitor and, and what I have to go out uh, there and do is to promote the child's developmental social, emotional and educational, religious and cultural needs. Um, and the way we do that is we recruit volunteers, we train them very effectively, efficiently and professionally, ensure that they are the right person to be matched with a young person, which is effectively in a befriending role. I like to use the term professional friend myself. Um, so it is a friendship, but with the professional boundaries of an organisation behind them. So befriending involves establishing that uh, with the child, a sense of trust in the relationship. And that allows the young person to talk about issues that might be going on in their life, support the care plan that is given to us and worked with with the social worker in most cases. That's where the referrals come from. And the social worker will give us outcomes um, that they would like to see worked on with the young person over a period of time. And these are usually quite lengthy relationships. So to aim as far as possible to complement the activities of carers and social workers and work really effectively as a team. Uh, when we started, obviously we were in lockdown and that made it quite a difficult situation to run a service that was so dependent on having a face-to-face -face relationship. And um, so during that time, we used the opportunity to have a complete review of the service um, from the most basics of paperwork to the current matches that were occurring to the volunteers that we actually had in place. Um, all of the matches that were in place concluded naturally during that period, so it left us with a, a good blank sheet of paper to work from and we talked to all of the current existing volunteers that we had and we were left with seven volunteers at that stage 
moving towards September 2020, when we started to work around um, getting matches back face to face again. We brought in very, very strict COVID risk assessment in place. So for each and every visit, there was a COVID risk assessment completed um, and matches started to occur from September 2020. During that period, from our seven volunteers, we've now jumped to 42 volunteers as of Tuesday. So we have a lot of people ready. 17 matches completed by March 2021 and the waiting list cleared, which was the most important thing, as there were a couple of young people that had been waiting due to coronavirus for quite a lengthy period of time. Again, since that 17, actually in the last week, it's jumped to 22. So we are getting there. Um, and, that, and that equates to about 2.2% of our young people that have been matched. So we've a long way to go to get to 94, but we are making inroads into this and, and ensuring that referrals are dealt with um, within one month of uh, a referral coming through to us that they get matched within that time. Moving forward, um, communication is probably the main thing moving forward now to make sure that we get to every team um, to every team within Children and Young People Services to ensure that professionals know we exist and that that is a statutory obligation to offer their service to looked after children. And um, we're working with um, Rob um, at the Children in Care Council to uh, develop literature that is designed by young people for the, the literature that's appropriate to them to design their own literature in a co-production approach. Um, as I've mentioned, no more than one month waiting time, and we're keeping to that now. Um, we were ready for full scale referrals from 2020, and also to ensure that this isn't um, just a relationship that's based on assessment, um, which is often happening for looked after children, but actually this is an opportunity to go and have some fun uh, with, a, with a volunteer whilst working on those outcomes. So, so quite a lot. So that's the basis of the report. Hopefully the, the, um, the actual report for the panel answers the questions that the National Independent Visitor Network wanted um, from us. Thank you very much for that, Mark. Um, uh, I always think it's nice to have an adv advancement in knowledge and um, you just think that, uh, get to the point where you think you know most of it things and then something new comes along. So mm -hmm. thank you very much for that and enlightening us on that one. I did have a, a couple of emails from a colleague, I think from Bernardo's on, on, on this particular situation. So I'm glad now that I can uh, re respond to it and say we've had you uh, to give us a, an update on that, which has been most helpful. Um, I want to ask, is, is, is any member have any questions of Mark, please? Well, it certainly looks like you, you did a, a good job there, Mark. There's no, no questions. So can I say thank you very much? I think it's the first time we've, we've met. Um, yes. And um, so th thank you very much for that. And thanks for the information you've given us. Thanks, thank Councillor Joe. Okay, I was just reading the, 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 the sort of board there the, beside the chat function, just in case I'd missed something. So thanks very much. Um, next is um, item 10 and it's proud moments and I, I think we, we have two instances of proud moments here and, and Helen remind me were you going to give us a proud moment or was it or was it Jane? Uh, so Claire is going to share something and then uh, Jane is also going to share something on behalf of Martin. Okay C can, can Claire come in first then please? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, so the, the proud moment for this month, and like I say, every time we meet, there's so many to choose from. So I really struggled last night working through them all, but it was such a pleasant evening thinking about them all. Um, so the proud moment I've got is we've got one of our young ladies who lives with us and moved in um, to her new home last summer. Um, she came with a big bang and a big bump and has really put us through our paces um, since she's moved in. She's equally put um, her school through their paces as well. But the really proud moment that I've got is last month, 
just at the back end of last month, I got a lovely letter from her telling me how proud she was at the leaflets that she's designed and commented on and the poster that she's designed as well that shares her views as a young person and her poster and her leaflet was so good she's actually won a competition from that and the letter she sent us showed as she was designing it as she was doing it the final final picture um, and she wrote about how pleased she was that she was able to identify a talent and how brilliant her talent was and how excellent her artwork was and how wonderful everybody who looked at her artwork and seen her do it and how much praise she got from it. That confidence just absolutely soared. Um, our confidence not just in drawing and artwork, but our confidence to talk about our art and talk about that with other people and have them asking questions. And it was just wonderful to see and wonderful to read. Um, and when I spoke to her, our confidence is so big now. She's decided what her career is and she's going to be a makeup artist and nail designer um, if she doesn't become a famous artist. And isn't that just wonderful? Um, it's really helped our school. It's really helped her with our relationships. And I just couldn't be more proud of her. Um, I just think that's wonderful. So that's my moment. And I'm happy to take questions, comments. If anyone has any questions. It doesn't look so, but it certainly has been a proud moment, isn't it? And it's it's good to hear that you you um you struggled last night to select uh, because there were so many proud moments. Um, it's always a very positive sign, isn't it? Um, it's 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 good to see that you struggle as well because I struggle most nights. So, can we um sort of a third final question? I'm looking. Anne Reed, Councillor Reed, you have requested to speak. Thanks, Chair. Um, it wasn't a question, Claire. It's uh, just a comment, really, and just um, what, a, what a brilliant thing for that girl to come so far. And I presume with a great deal of support from our wonderful fostering and adoption, our children's services. Um, one thing I was going to say when you said um, she designed leaflets, um, I think there might be a niche there for her, especially with the county council as an election time. I'm sure she'll make herself a few pounds um, if she went that way. Um, but, you know, well, well done to all of you people as well for, like I say, supporting her, because I, I, I can understand just how difficult it can be when you've got someone coming in in the same, you know, in the mind frame that they do come in and then helping them to get to overcome that. Uh, so well done to her as well. She must have put an awful lot of effort into that. Yeah, huge amount of effort. And I'll and I'll go back and I'll pass that back to her because she'll be so proud to know that everybody was so happy with with her achievement and how well she's done. And she'll love to hear that feedback. So thank you very much, Councillor Reid. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. So thanks very much for that, Councillor Reid, and thank you, Claire. Um, and, and please pass our thanks on to everyone concerned, um, the, the young person and obviously the, the people that have, uh, staff that have encouraged her along the way. That's fine. Thanks very much. Um, I don't think I have anyone else asking, uh, asking questions here. Um, can I pass over to Jane now, please, for your proud moment? Thank you. Jane Watson, Senior Partnerships Officer. This is actually Martin Stenton's proud moment. Um, he just couldn't make it, so I'm raising it on his behalf. It's just to say that in Children and Young People Now, in April, there was a really positive article about Aircliff Secure Centre. You'll remember that at the last full inspection in 2019, they got outstanding in all areas. And in the assurance visit in November 2020, it was just to say that um, they found really high standards had been maintained and it was just a really positive article praising the staff and the young people for that. So I will circulate that document to members of the corporate parent and panel so everyone can read it and have sight of that. Thanks very much for that. Um, we'll, we'll not ask if there's any questions of you, Jane, because obviously you're putting, oh goodness there are. Uh, Helen Ferguson has um, requested to speak. Okay, Helen. 
It was just to update the panel that actually um, following the really, really positive inspections for um, Acliffe Secure Unit over the last 12 months, Ofsted did come back into um, Acliffe Secure Centre um, two weeks ago. Um, so we're waiting for the published report. Uh, but again, it was a very it was a very positive visit with very positive feedback. Yes, and I think I think sort of a County Durham is to be commended on the facility of, of Aircliff. Um, it, it appears a very, very good facility. I mean, I, I have visited on a number of occasions and uh, I, I'm very impressed. I'm impressed with the facility. I'm impressed with the commitment of staff and, and lots and lots of aspects of it. So that's, that's great. Thanks very much for that. So let's uh, move on now to um, item 11 on the agenda and it's over to you again Helen for the um, reg regulation 44 commissioning arrangement update. Yes uh, I just uh, want to use the opportunity to update um, panel members in relation to um, the plans for our uh, regulation 44 visiting service. You'll recall at the last meeting Mark Smith came to the panel with a report um, outlining the proposals for making some changes to that. Um, so the arrangements as they currently stand for the Acliffe Secure Centre are going to remain um, as they have been, uh, but the arrangements for the Regulation 44 visiting service for our community children's homes are going to change. Um, so next week that, that will go out to tender, um, which will allow organisations to um, uh, express an interest to come and deliver that service on behalf of Durham County Council. Um, and we're expecting those new arrangements to be uh, in place and up and running by um, June. So it's it's quite quick um, and we'll, we're really looking forward to uh, working with, with a really good provider following that exercise in relation to that service. As soon as we have them in place, we'll um, ask them to come and meet with you all and introduce themselves uh, and talk to you about exactly how they're planning to deliver that service uh, over the next few years. Thanks very much for that, Helen. Are there any questions, please? <clears throat> no one having any problems with the unmute unmuting or anything, is there? Just check in. OK, thanks very much for that then, Helen. But, um, that, that was most useful and we look for, well, I'm sure you look forward to the progress in the future. Um, I, I, I'll be keep asking people about how things are progressing, even though I am um, uh, I won't be here. So the next thing is such business as in the opinion of the chair of the meeting is of sufficient urgency. Um, what I would like to do is use this part of the meeting just to say um, a, a few thank yous. Um, I, as you know, won't be standing for re-election or I'm not standing for re-election um, next week and therefore uh, will uh, no longer be a, a member of the council. And obviously, as a result of that, I, I, I couldn't be a chair of corporate parenting. However, uh, I have been um, a member of the corporate parenting for some eight years now, and I have found it a very, very pleasing experience. Um, I've worked with some fantastic people, um, both members and officers. And it's nice to see, and I think uh, I'm being honest here, nice to see uh, the progress that has been made in, in the, the business of it. Um, we have had some rocky, rocky times, but uh, we have got through those rocky times and we, we have come out at the end of, in a very positive way. So, you know, I'd like to say thanks very much to all officers, ones that have been with me or I've been with from um, 2013 and ones that have joined us uh, 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 more recently. It's been a pleasure to work with you all. Um, it's nice to see that you have the, the children um, at, at heart and want to do the best for the, our children and young people. And that's the same about the um, members of the, of the committee or the panel, shall I say. Um, one of the nice things I find about the corporate parenting panel is, is that um, there, there is no ego there. Um, you sit on some committees where ego gets in the way of progress and that has never been the case with corporate parenting. Every member has had the best interest of the panel and of uh, the young people at heart. What I'd also like to say is how it, um, we are 
getting more young people to participate. It's a very, very um, uh, interesting development and a very pleasing development. And I think it's important that we have young people um, sort of join us and give us their perspective and help with the development. So thanks very much for that. I would also like to pass on the thanks of Councillor um, Heather Smith. Unfortunately, Councillor Heather um, has had a bereavement in the family and therefore couldn't be here today. But she asked me to pass on those same um, good wishes to you all. Uh, good luck for the future. And um, she has also enjoyed her time as a member of the Corporate Parent Panel and as Vice Chair of the Corporate Parent in Panel. Another member that I have um, been made aware will not be um, standing for re-election is Councillor Jude Constantine. And Jude Con Councillor Constantine has been a, a very, very active member of the panel, um, always uh, there to ask questions and quite challenging questions too. And I'm sure that she will be a big miss too. So can I say to you all, uh, whatever the future has in store, best of luck and I uh, hope everything goes very well for you all. Thank you. For, oh, someone, oh, sorry. Uh, Helen? Yeah, I just wanted to take the opportunity um, on behalf of the service and the panel, uh, Ivan, to um, pass on our um, thanks to you as chair and also to Heather as vice chair. Um, it, it really has been an excellent working relationship um, and you really will be missed. We would just really like to thank you for the support that you've given to um, us as officers, but most importantly to our children and young people. Um, we've made some really significant progress after the last over the last 12 months. Um, and I don't know whether everybody's aware of this, but certainly whilst the corporate parenting panel wasn't in a position to meet, um, we set up some monthly regular meetings with some of our children and young people. Um, those of the, those young people who've been on the call today have been part of a regular monthly meeting that Ivan and Heather have been at in order to make sure that we kept uh, those links really, um, re really tight and really close. Um, and so your commitment to that and your commitment to the work and the young people um, is really appreciated and has made a, a really significant difference to how we've got through COVID. So a very big thank you. Thank you very much for that, Helen. That is much appreciated. I'm certainly going to miss the corporate panel, but um, thank you for that. And now I have, um, let's see, oh, Jane, right, uh, quest to speak. Is that thank you. Um, we just received an email from Councillor Gunn. I don't think she has made it into this meeting, but she asked that we could read something out for her. So are you happy for me to do that now? Yes, I'm very happy. Thank you. Bear with me while I just move it under this screen. So, Alwyn says, I would like to thank all members of the Corporate Parent Panel for their commitment and indeed their passion in supporting this crucial part of the work of children and young people's services. I know how much time, effort and expertise goes into this work. I would also like to thank the Chair and Vice Chair for their strong leadership in moving the work forward and particularly during the serious restrictions and difficulties during a year of a pandemic. My thanks also go to the Children in Care Council who have stepped up and shown us their strength and creativity. They are special. Nor could I forget to thank our officers, our staff, our amazing frontline workers who have gone not just the extra mile, but thousands of them. To everyone, a big and grateful thank you, Alwyn. Thank you for that, Jane. Um, that, that, that's uh, very, very nice. And I'm, I'm pleased that you have been able to sort of read that out. It's a pity that, that uh, Councillor Gunn couldn't be here in person, but um, uh, that, that, uh, that, that email or letter has been very, very uh, welcome and, and uh, we thank her for that. Um, I'd, I'd like to move swiftly on now to, um, we're doing pretty well for time here, uh, but I need a resolution now um, uh, to, for the exclusion of the public during the discussions of items contained exempt information. So can I have a, a, a proposal resolution, please? Uh, can I have a proposal from uh, the floor, please? I propose a resolution. Councillor Pauline Craythorn. Thank you, Councillor Craythorn. And can we have a seconder for that, please? I'll second it, Ivan. It's Councillor Shirley Quinn from Children and Dean Valley. Thank you, Councillor Quinn. So what we will do now is we will give um, just a, a, a few moments 
in order for those that are, uh, are no longer um, allowed to, to remain with us, just to leave the meeting. And Ian, if you can tell me when we're in a position to uh, progress 